Hello and welcome back to our series on research and writing. And this is part two of two on formal academic writing. In part one, we covered the areas of audience and formal writing to the professors and colleagues. We covered tips on the formal and impersonal style of writing. And we also covered a lot of important keys to sentence structure, such as simple, complex, and compound sentences. Now we're going to cover the next two areas of full words and objectivity, and we'll close with some rules for writing with clarity. Now the third area we wanted to work in is this idea of using full words, not contractions. You'd want to use do not, not don't. You want to use full words with abbreviations. So use Romans, not R-O-M period. You'd want to use the word photograph, not photo. Now the exceptions here are at times if you are going to use a word persistently in a formal paper and you tell the reader, you give them an idea that you are going to use a specific abbreviation for a word uh, throughout the paper. There are ways you can build this into papers, but generally speaking, you want to avoid those sort of abbreviations. This leads then to the idea of acronyms. Now, often we're used to using these in describing common things like, oh, I went to the DMV. But in an academic paper, we can't assume people know what those are. So we have to make sure those are clearly defined. So we could use UBS, but only after previously defined in your paper as United Bible Societies. And this then leads to the idea of objectivity. You want to use persuasive language that makes a strong assertion, but avoid use of things like I think and in my opinion. So we want to say the scriptures are clear, but not I think the scriptures are clear. I mean, this paper is written by you, so obviously all the content is what you think or believe. So qualifying it just adds extra words that are unnecessary. You're trying to persuade a reader. You're trying to get them to believe your thesis, what you're trying to get across. So just making simple declarative sentences, the scriptures are clear, is fine. Don't add words like, I think, or in my opinion. You want to use facts backed by qualified primary sources. Use studies show 90% of internet users click links to watch videos of kittens playing. Okay, that's a good formal academic sense that's backed up by stats but what you won't want to say most people really like watching videos of kittens playing now that is true okay that might be true you can say okay that's a great sense but again it doesn't qualify it's your strong assertion but it's not backed up by some sort of formal study or a source that can validate your thinking you also want to be judicious in your use of absolutes such as always never constantly. No one. Can these be used in academic formal writing? Yes, but you have to be very careful that you don't overuse them. So we could use this idea that studies show that the majority of people reject suicide as a benefit to society. But you could never say no one believes suicide is a benefit to society. First, because it's not true, there are some people that would make that argument, sadly. But two, even if it was 99.9% .9 of the people, you can lose people when you assert things as absolutes that in their mind, they might know have an exception to. Even if it's one in a million exception, if you're that reader that's reading and you can come up with that exception, that can disqualify the paper as valid. So be very careful in your absolutes. And finally, now that you're able to understand more clearly the principles of formal academic writing. I, I want to address the issues of writing for clarity. You have to get your ideas across in a way that the reader can understand. So you want to use words that convey a clear meaning so your readers can better grasp your ideas. So use things like the food smelled of mold. We all know what that smells like, right? But you can't just say the food smelled nasty. Because what you think is nasty might be different from what I think is nasty. There's a cultural distinction. You know, people can go to other places and a delicacy in one country can be disgusting to somebody from a different place. So nasty isn't a good descriptor, but saying it smelled of mold 
is something that is tangible that the reader can have a clear understanding of what you're saying. You'd want to use something like many people rejected the findings of the study, but not many people felt bad about the findings of the study. You can see this in newspapers and when people talk about studies, they use these more subjective terminologies which can distort the results or meanings of even of objective studies. So do you see what's happening in the second sentence? The idea that some people felt bad doesn't convey why. So some people might have felt bad because they felt that too many people rejected the findings. Some people may have felt bad that not enough people rejected the findings of the study. So why doesn't tell us, but being precise and saying many people rejected the findings gives a clear declarative sentence that lets your reader know what your point is. When you're writing for clarity, the use of active voice where the subject performs the action is very important. You want to avoid using the passive voice, which can obscure the meaning. Now, this is probably the other uh, issue that I see most often is this use of passive. I struggled with this in my early writing days uh, a lot, and I had some good instructors that helped me get over this use of passive. And so maybe that's why I see it and notice it now because it's an area where I have personally struggled. Here's a few examples. Use the work summarizes Pauline theology. You don't want to say this work is a summarization of Pauline theology. Can you see the difference there? That first one is far more clear and precise in its meaning because it tells us what the work does. The work summarizes. We can go on there and say, for clarity, when two independent clauses share a common noun, use an appositive noun or noun phrase to condense them into one. So this is the idea of when you have multiple sentences, try to combine them into one, especially if they're saying the same thing. So, for example, you want to use, my father, a dentist, plays golf on his day off. Don't write two separate sentences, my father is a dentist. He plays golf on his day off. Or maybe it would be more clear if I said, my father's a dentist, period. My father plays golf on his day off. See how both sentences are relying on my father to make a point when the first example, the way we should use it, we can take those two simple sentences and make one complex sentence that is a lot more clear and gets our point across much faster to the reader. Here's another example. We could use, my friend Bill was late for work. What we don't want to do is say, Bill is my friend. He was late for work. Again, Bill is the subject of both sentences, so make those into one nice, neat sentence and your readers will appreciate your work a lot more. Another good tip is to use parallelism when you need to organize similar grammatical elements within the same larger verbal structure to highlight the similarity between those two elements. So for example, we can use perch are inexpensive, cod are cheap, trout are abundant, but salmon are best. See how we're comparing all these different kind of fish to give the reader an idea of the value of each kind in which, in this case, we say salmon is the best. But here's the way you would not want to write that. Perch are inexpensive, period. Cod are cheap, period. Trout are abundant, period. But salmon are the best, period. So not only have we started our last simple sentence with the word but, which we know we're not supposed to do, but now we have these four simple sentences that are all around the same idea of describing these fish, and it's too much for the reader. When we can make a nice, very straightforward thought, a complete thought, by combining all these simple sentences into a more complex but straightforward sentence that allows them to see the contrast between each of these fish. Now, one thing to be aware of is the use of dangling modifiers. A dangling modifier is a word or phrase that modifies a word not clearly stated in the sentence. So I can say this, Abraham Lincoln wrote the Gettysburg Address on the back of an envelope while traveling from Washington to Gettysburg. So now we know we clearly, Abraham wrote this address and he wrote it on the back of an envelope. But now watch, just by switching around a few words and creating a dangling modifier, watch how confusing that sentence can become. 
Abraham Lincoln wrote the Gettysburg Address while traveling from Washington to Gettysburg on the back of an envelope. So wait, did he write the Gettysburg Address on the back of an envelope? Or was he traveling to Washington on the back of an envelope? You see, the order and structure of that sentence, all the same words, just organized differently, creates this dangling modifier where on the back of the envelope is modifying the wrong word. We wanted to modify wrote, not the word travel. So be very careful for these kind of things when you write. Okay, so our final tips for clarity are simply these. Proofread by printing out the paper and reading aloud to yourself. As I'm correcting student papers, I think probably at least half of the errors I see are simply because they never went back and reread this out loud to themselves. See, when you write your own paper, it's hard to catch your own mistakes because in your mind, you fill in what you meant to say with what you actually put on the paper. So your mind will kind of trick you into reading what you are thinking as opposed to reading what's actually on the paper. So when you print it out and change mediums, you're no longer staring at a screen, but an actual piece of paper. By reading that piece of paper out loud, you're hearing those words and your mind can't trick you as easily into hearing something that's not there. So this is a great tip for proofreading. Print it, read it out loud to yourself. Then the next, have a friend proofread on their own. Once you've done that, Take a print out of your paper, give it to a friend, have him mark it all up because they're going to see the mistakes that you can't see because it's they're not their own paper. They're reading it for the first time with fresh eyes and that will catch a lot more mistakes. And then the third step, you want to proofread again by reading aloud to a friend. So get the paper back, make all the changes suggested by your friend and then print it out, read it again. Now read it out loud to somebody else. And as you read out loud to somebody else, you're going to catch more stuff. And your other friend who is also hearing it now for the first time will hear it in a different way because they're not just reading it in front of them. So by doing this process, three kind of proofreading, proofread out loud to yourself, have a friend proofread, then proofread it out loud to a friend, you will do well in creating high quality, well-written formal academic papers. I really hope this video helps you in knowing what are the essentials to good formal academic writing. So if you apply all these tips and tricks, head to the library, find some books, read some of the great authors out there, and learn to emulate their style and the quality of what they're putting out. That's it for this episode of the 10-Minute Teacher. Have fun writing.